Hello, welcome to Pop Up Submissions. We're live. We are the show that each week, every Sunday this time, well, what do we do? We explore the world of publishing with me, my special guests, and most of all, you, of course, and the people in the genius room, too. We're looking for tomorrow's best selling authors and best selling books. And here to help me. Oh, yes, his second book is out now, Kings of a Dead World. He's proud of it. We are even prouder of him because he was one of the very first ever Litopians. It's Jamie Mollett. And over on the other side of the virtual room, well, you know his magical narrator's voice. Now, meet the man behind the legend. It's Robert Derry. And what do we have here? We've got a nice endorsement from Michael. Short, sweet. Thank you, Michael. Thank you all so much for the feedback. I really appreciate it. We appreciate your feedback, too. Remember, you can comment on us. We comment on your writing. It's only fair that you comment on us. And please do leave comments in the uh, uh, underneath. I was going to say in the YouTube chat room. The YouTube chat room is live right now. You make an interesting comment uh, in the chat room. We will put it on the screen. But after the show, if you're watching the recording, you can also leave a comment there too, and it will be appreciated by today's authors. Very special day today. This is how it's looking for the end of this month. Now we're actually counting this show as the last show in September and so and, and so it's an incredibly important show of course as you can see Becky Rush her upmarket historical fiction is still in pole position it's been like that all month followed closely by A.B. Khan's speculative noir psychological horror and shooting into third place was a real crowd pleaser and uh, winner of our last show Andrew Cunningham's books booze Bus stops, uh, professional confessional from the world of boarding schools. Well, now, this is the last show in September. Yes, I know what you're thinking. It's October the 3rd. Yes, but because I was away last week, we're counting this as a September show, which is fine because October has got five Sundays in any case. So take one away. It's still four. That's great. Now, what are we all, what are we all getting excited about? Well, because it's the last show and that will work out who this month's winner is and something very special will happen to them. With over 100 worldwide number one bestsellers, Head of Zeus is a formidable British-based publishing powerhouse. Independent Publisher of the Year, Digital Business of the Year. The awards and tributes keep rolling in. Now, Pop-Up Submissions has partnered with Head of Zeus to find tomorrow's best-selling authors. Each month's pop-up winner will be fast-tracked straight to them for their expert consideration. We know writing is never easy but now, Pop-Up Submissions makes it easier for you and your work to find a great publishing home. Yeah, and that is why the winner of this week's show, this live show right now, is terribly important because that person becomes de facto, if they beat the amazing score that Becky Rush has got, of course, they will become this month's winner, Fast Track Straight Ahead of Zeus. Without further ado, let's get straight on. Very first submission of the day. And this comes from Daphne. It's non-fiction. Very, very happy to get non-fiction, actually. Uh, we don't get enough of it. We want more, please. So if you're, if you're kind of wondering, hesitating about sending us something, and you've got a bit of non-fiction manuscript in your, bo in your bottom drawer, dig it out, send it to us. And it's called Far-Fetched Travels with Ten Poems in Nine Languages. And this is Daphne's blurb. Far-Fetched tells of my attempts to read 10 poems in French, Spanish, Greek, Italian, Shivenda, Polish, Scottish Gaelic, Arabic and Mandarin. With a little help from my bilingual friends, I journey into the world of each poem. Sometimes my findings are funny, sometimes they're strange, but I never come back empty-handed. Each chapter outlines my experience with the language, my engagement with the poem, and a reflection on one or more themes, mistaking, forgetting, and being an outsider. How very interesting. Of course, uh, last week's recorded show was all about poetry. So, yeah, we're, we're riding that wave at the moment. I'll tell you about Daphne. This is what Daphne uh, writes. I have some good things on my side. A track record as a writer, friends and colleagues from all over the world with the patience and generosity to help me. Some experience of language learning and a long-standing fascination with poetry. 
I have a degree in English literature from the University of Cambridge, an experienced writer. Since 20, uh, 2004, I've published around 30 solo or, or co-authored journal articles and book chapters on topics related to higher education, and in particular on reading and reflection. Uh, in an attempt to bring my ideas to a wider audience, I've written and performed very good. So difficult to do that if you're a poet. Uh, successful shows at both the Edinburgh Fringe and the Leeds Literary Festival and the Edinburgh International Conference Centre's live online series. I retired in March 2020 from the University of Edinburgh and I'm now focusing on writing for the general reader. It's my ambition to live up to one of my reviews. This is, this is good, isn't it? Um, every so often, this is a quote, every so often uh, a little book crosses your path stops you in your tracks and encourages you to look at the world around you with a different set of eyes. Rich Pickings, that's the title of the book, your book, is one such book. It's quite, quite nice. I hope that Farfetched will be another. Following that, I have in mind an adventure with songs in Scottish Gaelic. Wow. Well, hold on a minute. Let's, uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's instead get a fabulous reading by Emily. Farfetched Travels with Ten Poems in Nine Languages by Daphne, read by Emily. Chapter One, in which the reader is warmly welcomed. The title of the book is explained, and some hints are given as to the origins of the idea. Treasures, bric-a-brac, bladder-rack. Come in, sit down, and make yourself at home. I'm glad you found your way here. I have some things for you. Treasures, bric-a-brac, bladder-rack. Here is a self-proclaimed Chinese slut and a Polish trifle, a Chilean instruction manual and a finger pointing from South Africa. Let me explain a bit about this book. It tells stories of my encounters with ten foreign language poems and how I managed to make sense of them, with a little help from my friends. In the spring of 2020, I had just retired from the University of Edinburgh and was immediately set into lockdown by the coronavirus. I had time to read and write, and the chance to think while I trundled my tricycle along the quiet lanes near my home. I became aware that through my work I had contact with a number of intriguing people who spoke a range of enticing languages. I have always been drawn to both foreign languages and poetry, and here was a way of bringing them together. I decided I would invite a number of people to choose a poem in their first language and ask them to help me to make sense of it. I set myself the challenge of ten poems in ten languages. In the end it turned out to be nine languages because Greek insisted on appearing twice. Here are contributions from literary scholars and from those who feel they know very little about poetry. So where did I get the title? Farfetched, originally referring to an item brought from a long way away and for that reason desirable and interesting. It came to mean something unlikely and implausible. It was just when exotic commodities were being introduced in Elizabethan England that Farfetched began to shift its meaning. In his classic 1963 skit, the US comedian Bob Newhart imagines Sir Walter, nutty Walt Raleigh, telephoning from the colonies about the commercial potential of newly discovered tobacco. The head of the trading company back in England is unimpressed. Let me get this straight, Walt. You brought 80 tonnes of leaves... This may come as a kind of surprise to you, Walt, but come fall in England, what kind of up to our... Things get worse when the hapless Walt tries to explain the potential of tobacco. You can shred it up and put it on a piece of paper and roll it up. Don't tell me, Walt, don't tell me. You stick it in your ear, right? Oh, between your lips. Then what do you do, Walt? You set fire to it. Then what do you do, Walt? You inhale the smoke. The years have added a darker irony to the story. Don't tell me it gives you lung cancer and it gives lung cancer to the people who are not even smoking it. This book is far-fetched in the original sense. I am bringing you poems from far away in both geography and time. They have the allure of the unfamiliar. I am aware that I also come dangerously close to that far-fetchedness that is weird, ridiculous and tries too hard and stretches credibility. Is there really any point in trying to read a poem in a language one does not understand? I think there is. As a child, I had a very poor sense of direction. People were surprised when I grew up to be an independent traveller. What they didn't realise was that if you've never had your bearings, you can't lose them. It was no more unsettling for me to be lost in Lisbon or Cairo than to be disorientated in the tiny village where I grew up. So it is with poetry. 
Any poem is a foreign country, and a foreign poem is not necessarily more inaccessible than one in your own language. As an undergraduate student of English literature in the 1970s, I was introduced to the art of practical criticism. Every week we were presented with a short piece of poetry, undated and anonymous, and asked to come up with an authentic response. Okay, so let's go to the genius room straight away and see what's what, take their temperature, and then we'll probably come to Jamie after that. Um, everyone has been very nice about Emily's reading, which was great, and she's she's virtually blush, blushing. I can see her now, actually. I can imagine her blushing away. It was great reading, Emily. Thank you. Um, RK Caps, I'm interested. Andy says it feels a bit meandery. He does, doesn't it? And that's supposed to be, I think, one of the beauties of it. If that meandering works, if you want to go down that particular, you know, avenue of world gathering that the author wants to take you down. I guess from Andy's comment, he doesn't. Uh, Martin says feel, it feels like a preface. I think it would be in better to continue in the vein of the opening paragraph, which was ear-catching. Uh, ear a nice concept, though. Vagabond says, well, to get to the actual poems and her reaction to them first. I, I was thinking that, too, actually. Less interested in her, her history. And Eva says, would benefit from a little, little less explanation. Actually, she was explaining the title of the book. I'm more into the action of the travel. Ed says, to me, this reads like the intro or the preface, not chapter one, and RK agrees with that. Jamie, your first reactions. Yeah, um, I think first off, it's it's a new idea which doesn't happen very often. Yeah, um, which is which in itself makes it quite interesting. I mean, possibly a little bit niche um, because of that, but it's it's new, which is which is very very rare. Um, I love the background text that you're reading at to start with as well. Re really interesting, I think. Hmm. And the the chapter headings great as well. Really like the chapter headings, but then I. Um, Sort of started to 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 lose it a little bit. I think it felt a, it's a bit, it was a bit too introverted and a little bit too inward looking. And it is yes. important with something like this to understand why she's writing it, but it doesn't need yes. to be. It feels a bit too academic. I don't know. I don't know if you've ever read a book called A Year Reading A Year of Reading Dangerously by Andy Miller, um, and it, which is amazing. And basically, uh, Andy's Andy's a really funny guy anyway. But he he basically spent a year. Um, uh, reading books that he'd told people that he'd read, but his wife called him out on not actually having read, and that so it had this narrative thread through it, which I think this is missing, because it actually turned out that, that as he was trying to read it, he, he, he just rounded off all over the place, and it was just a really interesting book, but it had this linkage of a narrative thread that, that pulled it all together, and that's what I think this is lacking. A little bit, yeah. it feels a little bit academic. One yeah. understanding more about her, but not in a, such a practical way as what she's done here. So, yeah, about, about, yeah and just sort of feed us in a little bit. Um, yeah. I thought the writing was nice, nice and conversational, just it not is, really yeah. sure where it was going at that point. It is, it is. I, I couldn't agree more, actually. To, you know, you, you, I got that feeling, I hadn't actually expressed it, but yeah, it is, it is. there is an inward looking quality to yeah. this that doesn't sort of invite me it, it's not it's not really about me it's it's more about about the author that can be interesting sometimes but not always um e.g logan entirely agree with emily's last comment what was what was emily's last comment emily of course our reader it's always great to get our narrator's reaction which is why i'm looking forward to talking to to robert um in a moment um emily says i would, would be really interested in reading this but felt that these first 700 words were a bit long-winded Mm. What did you think, Robert? Yeah, I think I would agree quite a bit with Emily's comment there. Um, in that it just felt like it was a lot of explaining about what the book is going to be about rather than get, getting straight into it. I would have really yeah. liked it to have kind of opened with one of the poems. I think yeah. a lot of people said that that, that first paragraph was quite nice, actually, because it did give mm. you that sense of I'm being drawn into a little you know, cosy cupboard here where I've got all these trinkets from all around the yeah, world kind of right. thing. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the effect that she was trying to create, but then it kind of just segued into, this is why I wrote that book. And I suppose you might have that in a preface or something, but it just didn't, it just didn't grab yeah. me from, from the get go really. Yeah. It was that, that Bob Newhart thing that made my a heart sink a bit i thought oh, i don't know that's that's supposed to be a nice little gobbit of you know useless information which you know frankly a lot of publishing hangs around really but uh, didn't i didn't get very excited about that really no um let's just see okay you give it you give you like the title you give them that that um, a decent number of stars they quite like the blurb 
Cry from the bang, the commercial bang, I should explain to everybody. That's the commercial potential, folks. Now, just come back for a moment to uh, both our panellists. Um, I want to particularly ask, ask you, actually, Jamie, but Robert, no doubt, will have some inspiration on this, too. It's, it's the commercial potential of poetry. So last week, when I wasn't here, we did this pre-recorded show that apparently nobody watched, uh, all about poetry with... Uh, an incredibly successful person, author, who'd actually put together three different anthologies in hardback, collective sales, 250,000 copies. You know, and here's me sitting on my little high horse sometimes saying to people, oh, sorry, poetry is just not commercial, it's not going to sell, which is true most of the time. But then you get someone who does something like that, 250,000 copies in hardback. It's astonishing, isn't it? I mean, that... Just putting, uh, taking off your authorial hat, Jamie, putting on your marketing hat because you're a big advertising guy. I mean, what would you, if someone came along to you and said, you know, money, no object, but I really want to sell poetry, sell the concept of, of reading poetry, what would you, what would, you, what would your first reactions be? It's, I mean, that, blowing my cheeks out, it's difficult. You're right, there's not many people who, who can do it. Like, you've got Holly McNish's in, of, of the world. Um, but I think the... Uh, the for her, it's not just her words; it's her personality. She's a she's a package. Yeah. Um, she's and same with Kate Tempest, and it's it's more than just poetry. I think poetry in itself is quite a hard sell because it can be perceived as quite quite dry, um, mm. and quite and quite. Uh, oh, how do I put this? More, more sort of more sort of wordy and at the at the sort of uh, unaccessible literary end of the, yes. of, the of the spectrum. Mm. Yes, um, I think where you where you succeed in it is if you package it as something that's short, sharp bites. Because because uh, let's face it, that's where the world's going at the anyway, isn't it? Where our attention span is minute. Yeah. So um, you know, short, short uh, things you can dip in and out of. Um, mm. Certainly, more contemporary poets seem to be seem to be doing better at the moment. I, I, I love Holly Manish. I think she's ama- I think she's amazing. But like I said, that isn't just. I mean, she's undoubtedly a great writer, yeah. but she's also incredibly uh, incredibly eloquent about about issues that are happening at the moment she's quite a public person um, yeah. she's funny outside of her work and I think that's where you get your that's how I would try and market you've got to be a brand to. name really haven't you to to succeed yeah. it looks like yeah. but then you know once you get over that hurdle once you get to breakthrough point I, mean, I, I always go back to poems on the underground um, people love it they love it, you know, yeah. and it, was, it obviously promoted the hell out of, and I don't know how many books they've sold now, or how many millions of copies they've sold, but clearly, you know, once you get to, to breakthrough point, people will buy it. I mean, um, having said that, of course, I can't remember the last time I bought any poetry. When I mean, do you read poetry, Robert? Do you buy it at all? Uh, I don't mind. I quite like reading poetry, but I would never, I'd never buy it. I, mean, I don't know why. I just just wouldn't buy it if I, if I saw it in the shop i probably wouldn't but yeah. you know if you if you stumble across something online or something then you go oh that's quite nice but then yeah. i don't know i just don't come in i mean i occasionally write a little bit of poetry but i'd never yeah. buy it i don't, I just don't, I don't know why but it's well it's well worth trying to write actually because it's it's very focused you know i mean it's you if you're writing a hundred thousand word novel and you can afford to you know to use a few loose words and loose expressions and so on with poetry you know you're a sharpshooter every word's got to be perfect yeah. it's great writing practice really yeah. oh hannah watched it's it thank you you were the one who watched thank you hannah <laughs> <laughs> all right let's uh um so what else can i add to that daphne um I, I think possibly the most valuable bit of advice there has come from Jamie, actually, is about building a personal brand, which is something you're doing, which is fantastic. So keep doing it. Very marketable name, I think. Daphne Loads. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. What does it mean to me, though? What does it mean to me? And that's the thing. It's not quite coming through at the moment from the uh, little bit of writing. I'd be intrigued to see some of your selections. Maybe you'll be kind enough to send them to us. <laughs> And here we are, submission number two. Oh, look at that title, The Art of Dying. Are you going to remember that? I think you will. Distinctive title. It's science fiction. It's from Kyle. I'm going to say Kyle McEwen, but I could be very badly wrong there. Uh, and as always, I'll give you the usual health warning, please. If, if there's anything that's slightly difficult to pronounce, do give me, um, yeah, give me phonetics, because otherwise I will mangle it to death. Here is Kyle's blurb. Ever since waking without her memory on the duplicitous island of Topanga, 23-year-old Alex Mercer has desperately searched 
for the identity of her parents. But a new contract promises a different kind of pay, information. All she has to do is hunt the elusive billion-dollar man, Maximilian Royvas. Amidst the gathering chaos, Alex Mercer is losing control and the dark presence growing within her is manifesting. Now she must navigate the seedy island and capture Royvas before she's consumed. Ooh, sounds like Venom a bit, doesn't it? Let me tell you about Kyle. Great idol. Has it been used before? Does it matter? Good questions. We'll answer those in a minute. Uh, I've been working on this manuscript, says Carl, for four-ish years, and now on this once hobby turned escapist fantasy into a potential career because I just need a win, something to work out. Totally understand that. I will be talking about that, actually, after we've heard a, an absolutely amazing reading. I know, because I've heard it from Kay. The Art of Dying by Kyle McKeon, read by Kay. Scene 1. Praying. Alex Mercer sat down on a stone bench across the street from Henry Shen's home, reached into her back pocket, pulled out her lighter and pack of crumpled cigarettes, patiently waiting for him to appear. Creating a meek spark, she guided the flickering flame as it kissed the nicotine. The front door creaked open and Henry Shen stepped out from his doorway with his briefcase in hand and checked his watch. The blinking numbers read eight o'clock. He closed the door firmly behind him, locked it and walked down the stairs entirely oblivious to her shadow cloaked in a tenebrous cape. There he is, she thought, eyeing her night's prey. When Woozy hands me a detailed folder on the man he wants dead, how can I pass up the opportunity? Most do because they're not like me. Down here, dwelling in the shadows, life's completely different. Down here, you have to kill to live until tomorrow. You need to learn how to survive. Life's first cruel lesson I learned as a gutter rat. Across the street, the fleeting row of Alex's cigarette crumbled to ash when she rose, keeping a watchful distance. Shen walked through San Francisco's Chinatown night market, passing vendors selling cheap imitation sneakers and jackets, stared into a fish tank and passed a lavish suit store. In front of a twisted cherry blossom tree in bloom, pink petals scattered the damp ground, trampled into smears. He stopped in the marketplace centre. Alex paused, hiding near a vendor selling opulent knockoff purses. Shen casually glanced down at his watch, then turned left into the ever-growing homogenous sea. Pushing her way through the fleshy tides, she paused to catch a glimpse of Shen. He stopped at the same noodle cart as he always did and paid for a bowl, disappearing further into the crowd. Her nose twitched as it caught a whiff of soy sauce, a brackish aroma that made her stomach howl. She thought about gorging herself, but losing him would leave her with one pissed-off woozy, and a visit from Mr. Sun. Fuck that idea, she thought, nervously shuddering. Tossing his empty bowl away, Shen quickly scanned the faces around him and dipped into an alleyway behind the lemongrass restaurant. Its grimy yellow neon letters flickered as Alex lurked close behind the wall, bathed in shadows, watching. He knocked three times and the back door flung open. When it slammed shut, she scurried over, pressing her ear to the door. Muffled shouts, cheerful laughter and dragged chairs were scraping across the floor. Looking around, she found a fire escape that led up onto the roof, giving her the perfect vantage point. Climbing up the creaking rungs, Alex rubbed the corroded flakes off her hands. In the middle was a pyramid-shaped skylight with a window conveniently propped open. The voices were clearer. The night concealed her every step as she snuck over to watch them from above, like an ominous raven. Cloaked in the night's sable embrace, she counted a pack of several triads down below in the kitchen. Four of them sat around a mahjong table in the middle of what appeared to be a tense game, and two others stood near the back door doing a damn fine job guarding the place. Off in the corner, muffled by hissing freezers, two others secretly talked. Looking down at her prey, Alex smirked. An old-school purple pinstripe suit, collar popped like he's trying to impress someone cheap. 
A flimsy piece of shit gold chain necklace dangling above his chest, shaped like an S. What a fucking jackass. The man Shen was conversing with was bald, had a permanent dour expression and wore a stained beater with orange track pants. To top it all off, a black dragon spiralled around his throat. His eyes honed on to the briefcase. He ushered Shen along and yelled at the four playing Mayong to move. One of them mumbled something that Alex couldn't understand and was promptly silenced with a swift smack to the head. The boss eagerly patted the table and Shen placed the briefcase down. Well, let's just go straight to the uh, genius room, who I think are making lots of really spot-on comments around the fire today, actually. Um, not that they're not always the least smoldering, but today it's incendiary. Um, Kate says assured pros. There's been some discussion there about whether the title's been used before. Ed says, yes, it has. It's been used as... Oh, seven other books. Thank you very much. SK9222 on YouTube. Thank you very much for checking. Um, Ed says, The Art of Dying is a George Harrison song. Does it matter that that it's been used before? Not necessarily. It doesn't matter. Um, you can use the same title um, the, as, as other people have used. If they've used it really recently, no. That's, that's going to be really confusing. Um, smoking, says RK, is going to put off some millennials. Vaping's the thing. Uh, Vic says, shifts in point of view, making me a bit dizzy. Um, night market in San Francisco. Yeah, Andy says it's so hard with smoking plus night market plus sci-fi not to equal to Blade Runner. Well, maybe that's the feeling that he's trying to to get over here. Um, so, prose needs to be pared down. Says Kate. Something is happening. Says RK. And I feel something is going to happen. Anna says could be because I've been gardening all day. What? <laughs> but I'm finding it hard to keep concentrating on this. There goes our YT rating. Yes, that's right. Somebody use the F word. Well, too bad. It just happens, doesn't it? Robert, first question. Are you going to read on? I probably would. I, I quite like it, actually. Um, okay. It is in the kind of genre that I would read. I read quite a bit of sci-fi, so it's kind of in the thing I would read. I thought exactly what uh, Andy D thought, which is uh, yeah. Blade Runner. I mean... It, it's both a good thing and a bad thing. It makes it derivative, but that familiarity is quite nice to exactly. To, to it's yeah. so it, yeah. it's a double-edged sword that one. Yeah. Um, I do think it's a good title, even though it has been overly used too much. I mean, maybe it's been used too much. Um, I think there's a bit too much description in places. Could have done with a little bit more pacing uh, yeah. to keep it going. But tighter. Um, yep. We don't know an awful lot about the character as well. That's another potential challenge. Um, yeah. But you know, I thought it, I thought it was solid. So, yeah, yeah, I excellent. Read. Good. Let's just go back to the genius room. See what else they've been saying. My vote is stuck. Says Eva. <laughs> Andy, who pointed out the um, the resemblance to to Blade Runner, and as you know, Robert says it's not necessarily a bad thing. There's a market. Oh my goodness, there's a market. Publishers will not be uh, short to to jump into that uh, that particular. Um, pond, and he says, I've decided my next book will be called The Hobbit. Very good. <laughs> I don't think you can do that because I think Hobbit is almost certainly a neologism, and I suspect it's probably trademarked too. Your reactions, Jamie? Yeah, fairly similar, I think. Um, the, blurb, so the blurb didn't tell me anything. I've still not really got any idea what this book is about, and I think, particularly in science fiction, you'd want to know that by the end of the first page. You'd want to have a, yeah. a, a, a point of direction of where you're going and, and, and I don't have that which which um, would probably stop me carrying on to be honest I think I would need to know where I, at least have some sort of awareness of what the direction and, and I, I'm a big Blade Runner fan so as soon as, as soon I've written that down as well as soon as that pops out All right, it's, really? I'm like yeah. oh been a, yeah. been a uh, noodles and neon and rain and yeah, and me night. too. That's yeah, I'm, I'm seeing night. it. I'm living it. But that's that's good yeah, for you, Kyle, isn't it? That's, I mean, he you know he he evoked something, and that's that's effective. Yeah, true. There was some, there was actually some nice writing in there. There was some lovely stuff. But I love fleshy tides. I thought it was good. Uh, there's some really nice little words, and I think overall the feeling, the the tone of the writing is nicely commercial. Like it's it's, it's it was well written. It's not trying to be. Um, Two word. Although actually, there is a couple of points where it's sort of a bit, little bit over it. And I think the main thing for me really was that, that considering that we're tracking somebody who's going to kill somebody, mm -hmm. it was quite pedestrian. Like there doesn't there wasn't a lot of tension in me for me there. And it really, you know, this is a presumably this is a trained killer tracking somebody that they want to bump off. I would have liked 
to feel a little bit more tension. We got I got sidetracked by the blossom because yeah. I'm forgetting that there's somebody who's on their way to kill somebody. And then there, there was one sentence at the start that was in in italics, and to me that was uh, really good. Like that that if you'd have just lost quite a lot around it, two you could lose two or three paragraphs and just kept that bit that was in italics. It would have been a quite a strong quite a strong beginning. But I think. You're editing, the, you're doing a good editing ending. job yeah, at the moment, which is, uh, it's always the, the worst thing in the world to try and edit yourself, as I'm sure you've heard out. Oh, it's impossible. Uh -huh. That is impossible. And, that, and that's why there are editors, frankly. Exactly. <laughs> because, um, I knew there was a reason. Yourself, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I think, I think there's, there's, I'm not sure what the story is. Um, I feel that there probably is something good in there, but I don't know what it is yet. And um, I would have liked to have seen it's just just sharp sped up a bit a bit more a bit more tension a bit more excitement to, to kick off yeah. what is what is a sci-fi book yeah yeah okay let's go to the chat room and he is he uh, and andy is on form today um uh, now yeah everyone's going on about the f word actually um, will it affect our YouTube thing? Probably, I don't know if it's going to get us demonetized or not, actually. It does happen sometimes. I think it's a bit random. Um, and to be honest, personally, I don't mind if we do get demonetized because when Kay says the F word with her wonderful Scottish brogue, <laughs> I, I like it. I like it. I do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say one thing to you, Kyle, please. And that is um, about this this thing about, yeah, I need to win, something to work out. I know I know that feeling. Every writer knows that feeling. Um, uh, agents feel the same as, uh, as well, actually. And the thing is that you've got to understand that this is a long haul. It's a long haul, right? And the more you do it, the better your chances are. Um, but it's still, finally, at the end of the day, whatever other, other cliches you want to use, there is a large element of luck. Ask J.K. Rowling. Ask her how many times she made a submission and failed. So, you know, eventually she got lucky and then, then the market took over, of course. So... With that element of, of luck, you can't pin all your hopes on one manuscript working. You will increase your chances the more you write. you just got to keep doing it. Think of it not as a sprint, but as a marathon. If you do that, then and keep your hopes, you know, focused and realistic, just keep going, keep going, keep going, then you will make it. But, you know, spending four years on one manuscript and hoping it's going to work out, it's going to be a very long shot. Those are, those are my words of advice for you. And straight on to submission number three. It's very exciting today because, well, we're going to get a winner. We're going to get a monthly winner. And who knows who that's going to be. It might be Richard. It might be Richard Pucci. With Peaceful Violence, that's his title. It's crime fiction thriller and a coming of age story. We start, says Richard in his blurb, we start with Officer Dick, who hates his name, sneaking into the doctor's office where the villain lies, getting his wounds stitched up. Detective Dick sees a shadow coming straight for him. He drops to his knee, curls the trigger of his gun, and we're left in suspense as we dive into chapter one. Right, so this is a strange blurb, I have to say, Richard. Um, I was wondering about this title. Our first chat room reaction, guess, um, uh, genius room reaction is straight in, and that's from Arcane, she, she loves it. Paul, a teenager, spends his evenings and mornings camping out at his favourite spot, alongside a waterfall within a lush forest. One morning, the sounds of power saw the sounds of power saws rip through the air. Lumberjack! <laughs> And that's it. You've been truncated. So that is that was a really bad blurb, actually. Um, speaking of blurbs, you need to um, you definitely need to do our blurb seminar, litopia.com slash blurb, and you'll you'll learn how to do it. But that's really bad. Uh, so I'm not going to give you good good points for that, Richard. But uh, let's let's hear a bit more about you. Um, started my corporation, Park Ridge Financial, in 2000, and currently serve as president www.parkridgefinancial.com Free ad for you. Although the company is wildly successful, my passion remains writing. Interestingly, I do plenty of it on the job. 
Um, I've always been passionate about uh, both about writing and reading. You say I completed 400 level courses on writing. What does that mean? 400 level courses. Is, does, I don't know. <laughs> You're way above my pay grade on that. And uh, composition at the undergrad undergrad level at Penn State University and the graduate level at San Jose Stat. I don't know what that is again. There's an awful lot of uh, truncation going on here. Actually, it, when you make a submission on the form, it gives it counts down the characters you've got. So do do have a look at that, please, because I I hate as mu as much as you do when things get truncated. But I know one thing for sure: you're not going to hate the reading by Barbara. Peaceful Violence by Richard Pucci, read by Barbara. Dick pulled to the curb, cutting both engine and headlights. Looking around, he realised this part of town, busy during the day, was crickets at night. Clutching the wheel, waiting, he noticed his hand shook. This disturbed him. He thought of himself as cool in these situations. The creeper's in there. He thought of the girl. The ambulance rushed her to hospital by now. Would she make it? I didn't protect her. That also bothered him. He gripped his steering wheel until his knuckles went white. He hoped he made the right decision, refusing backup. Maybe a huge mistake there. But with all the press pouring into Morgantown these days, no way he'd let this turn into a circus. This way is also part of the deal. Well, goddamn Drex deal. Not his. He surveyed Doc John's stately home resembling a southern mansion. Amish and hippie ornaments hanging from the porch surrounding the three quarters of the house. He's a doctor who practices without a license. Yet his home and office sat right smack on the busy corner of Market and Main in the centre of town. Great hiding spot. He smiled and shook his head. Someone should put a fence around this whole bloody town someday and study it. Why was he so nervous though? He should be happy with his breakthrough. But the creeper is in there. Where are they? He frantically patted his pockets with both hands. Oh shit, he forgot them. No, wait, there they are. Phew. He shook a single roasted almond from the little foiled pack and popped it in his mouth. He rolled it around with his tongue, enjoying the saltiness. He spread it out horizontally, centering it under his front bottom teeth. Applying equal pressure, he cracked it neatly, perfectly in half. He next focused the tip of his tongue on the now glass-like inner side of the nut. Smooth, cool. After chewing and swallowing, he did this to another, and another. He heard himself breathing deeply, way better than those packaday Marlboros. Once again, he was in charge, relaxed. Suddenly his smile dropped quicker than an anvil in water. A small black spot, V-shaped, in the backlit Venetian blinds appeared. It stayed there. Dick flashed his headlight once. The spot vanished. Two minutes later, a hulking figure scurried rat-like out of the side door. Look at him go. Interesting. A rat in a white laboratory coat. Showtime. Dick moved fast, efficiently. He slipped to the same side of the house where the rat departed. He bounced his eyebrows twice, appreciating the unlocked door. He unholstered his 357. Slipping inside, holding his piece with both hands, he pressed his back against the wall, sliding down the long hallway, making a slight scraping sound. The place had a chemical smell. Iodine? He peeked around the corner in the dark living room. Nothing. He noticed he had been holding his breath. He heard clanking sounds like somebody's moving stuff around. Controlling his breathing, back still against the wall, he quickly slid around the corner and squatted. He recoiled. A large shadow charged straight at him. Dick dropped to a knee. Harley tipped him off. The bastard! He aimed, clicked the hammer back, curled the trigger, prepared to fire and... No! Jesus! Chapter 1. Pamela Noticed. July 25th, 1973. Pamela stared, scrutinising, wondering if she even knew this other girl. Pamela studied her hard. Finally, Pamela said to the girl, Listen, you can do this. You're 17 now. Not a kid any longer. The girl appeared confident enough, so Pamela asked her, Is everything perfect? Today's the day, you know. No reply again, just a smirk. Pamela noticed the girl looked, what's the word, healthy, vibrant even, as the 83rd stroke ran through her hair, making a wishing sound at the end. 
Pamela noted her hair already possessed the desired shine, which only 100 daily brushes delivered. Now show me out those pearly whites. The quiet one, reflecting back from the mirror at Pamela, beamed, brushing in snaps and showing off perfect teeth, her high cheekbones forming two perfectly pinchable, pinkish circles upon her face. Remember, smile. It's your best feature, Pamela ordered. All right, straight to the genius room. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of very funny stuff going on in the, in the genius room. Actually, they're talking about Dick's nuts quite a lot. Uh, and, <laughs> Oh, yeah, we're definitely getting demonetized this week, I can tell you. Uh, <laughs> how do you bounce your eyebrows? I don't know. Um, the tension of a well-masticated nut. I'm going to ignore more nut comments. Uh, oh, no, I'm not. And it's an interesting nut moment. <laughs> uh, just study, study and learn. We, we, we live and worship at your feet, genius room. Never wrong. I get it wrong sometimes. They don't because cause they buy books. That's why. Um, thank you, Martin, for saying what was in my head, says Emily. Michelle says, I could listen to Barbara read the phone book. Well, it's good news, actually, at the end of the show. Barbara will be reading... No, she won't. She'll be reading... She will be reading the final submission of the day, which is very good news. Let's look at the numbers so far for you, Richard. Um, see, now mine... Look look at mine, for example. So I'm going to have to... And it's changing real time, obviously, as the votes come in. Um, I'm, I'm not wild on the title. The blurb, I think, is a complete mess. So you could tell that as I was trying to read it. So I've marked you really low on that. But I thought that was very assured writing, and I've given you high marks for craft, which is arguably the most important thing, really. Let's hear from Jamie. What did you think? Yeah, um, I'm fairly aligned with you. I think uh, the blurb... I don't know what the blurb was. I'm just giving uh, no idea. Um, and the title... I said, Do you know what he's got going most for him? His name. That, that is that man, Richard Poo Poo yeah. Poochie, yeah. is destined yeah. to write crime fiction. Like it's yeah. perfect. Oh, totally. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah, great branding. And he's got, yeah. yeah, brilliant. You can just see it in quite bold red font, can't you? With like a, yeah. On, at yeah. the top. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, gen I genuinely can't fault it in terms of writing. For, it just feels like a published crime novel. Like yeah. he's got everything. It he's does. got the tropes nailed. He's got the the, the costume, sentence structures it? nailed. It's it's yeah. just yeah, confident and and, and well done. I, I couldn't I couldn't fault it at all. Really. What in, about this title thing? Because I, I I it, my initial reaction is I really don't like that. And then I thought well, actually you know it could catch on. It, it's sort of if it, if it I've said this before on the show. But if it gets to the breakthrough breakthrough sort of point, then everyone says yeah, it's piece of violence. Oh, I read that. Have you read it? Um, but initially it doesn't it doesn't do anything for me at all. Does it float your boat? Um, I'm not sure what it means, and I, I, I no, don't know if that's a good thing really. or a bad thing. No. I, I, as long as it, I don't want it to be simply throw away. If it means something in the book, great. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's got it right, and you just need a strong two, one or two, two word title for this sort of thing. Um, but no, I, it's, I'm neither here nor there with the title yet. Um, yeah. But in terms of writing, really, really good, like, really good. Yeah, yeah. They're still talking about bouncing eyebrows, but we're not going Honestly, to. Honestly, I'm, I'm so English. I, I just, <laughs> anyone called like dicks or nuts, I just start oh, laughing. No. Like, we, it, we, we love we're a nation that, of don't we? Hill, aren't we? You can't we are. <laughs> the only thing missing was the, the fart gag. But, but who knows? There might be one coming later. Robert. Yeah, I, I actually really like the title, but I quite like oh, those okay. kind of uh, oxymoron titles where it sort of, yeah. it sort of interests me. Um, I, I wasn't as keen on the submission, but then that's probably because I don't really uh, read much crime. As soon as I kind of get a hardball detective, I'm a little bit like, oh, I can't really bother with this. So um, yeah. that might be why I was not quite as keen on it. Um, I found it a little bit too staccato. Like it, it, The rhythm mm. didn't quite flow for me. I didn't quite like the whole prologue and then we switched to this other character just just that just didn't work for me but yeah I know it, it might just be yeah. Just not for me, kind of thing. yeah yeah um there's definitely something there i think i think you're you're um yeah potentially uh you're really you're really quite a successful uh writer actually richard but at the moment the, the number of things are not working um i just want to you know what before we sort of um talk a bit more let's just talk to to, to you actually um uh robert about about narrating generally if you don't mind um, yeah, sure. I just th this is always an interesting thing. I mean, I I love having uh, narrators on, 
Uh, and you certainly are one of the most distinguished narrators we have. You get inside, absolutely inside the the mind of, of every writer. I mean, what's what's the what's the main challenge you you face when when you get seven hundred words in front of me and you think, okay, how am I going to do this one? Am I going to am I going to adopt an accent? Barbara, who narrated the last one, was saying in the in the genius room, she didn't want to because she wasn't good at the accent. I mean, how do you approach it? Um, you're always trying to look for the uh, the character or, or the voice. The, the hardest submissions to read are the ones that are devoid of any character or voice. That they're just kind of just, yeah. even if it's just sort of high action, if it's got no depth to it, if you can't sort of feel a sense of character or words that you can play with and stuff like that, then it gets a bit dull. Um, yeah. And narrating, I mean, I re- always recommend that writers do this if they read your own work yes. you pick up on all the bad stuff that you've done and all the clunky sentences that you've got it's as soon as you do that you you, you notice that hang on this just, just doesn't flow at all yeah so why don't um, writers really do that is- why don't they read it out loud it's insane not to really often, i think quite often mm. the first time a, a writer hears their work is when you or one of our other narrators actually reads it which is just yeah, far too probably. late really I don't know why they don't. Anyway, no one's going to answer that. I think you just feel a bit stupid, don't you? Sat sat in your living room just reading your stuff aloud, <laughs> but it, it it works. So I can't can't more than recommend it. I would, yeah. I would heartily recommend it as well. I I, I realised it when I when I actually went out with my first novel and sort of did literary festivals and stuff and and got to read, you know, had to read it and I was like, read ah. it. And I was like, oh, that's I don't like that sentence. Yeah. Oh, that's hard to read. And then you yeah. you got. So I do read it out loud now, just for that very reason. Because as soon as you stand up in front of people and you start reading, you just like like uh, like you said, it's you find the mm-hmm. lumpy bits. And I tend to, I actually tended to change them when I to what would have sounded better. Um, well, as, as you as you yeah. were reading, you thought, "Oh, I'm going to put a full stop." Yeah, now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> basically self editing. Edit it, edit it <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How did you find that? Because I mean, obviously, in your you know your your job as an advertising person, you do you you meet a lot of people and have to present and stuff. So it's yes, probably a bit totally easier for you. Uh, really, I was no, going to ask, I, how easy is it for for the average author to do what you've been doing? Go to going to festivals, reading your own stuff, and standing up and I'm totally an author. Easy. Listen to me. Um, I I do pitching all the time. I present ideas. I talk. I, I chair big meetings, and I thought therefore it's going to be an absolute doddle to, be, to read my own work. Yeah. So I thought when when the first novel came out, I was like, do you know what? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna hone it a little bit. So I went to speak to a voice coach, and she said, "Oh, did Here you go, read the first page? Yeah, just just that, just because I good thought idea. what a good I idea. don't want to put myself out there." Yeah. And then I um I read the first page, and she just looked at me, shook her head, and went, "Oh my dear, we've got a lot of work to do." <laughs> <laughs> but what <laughs> no, a clever right, thing to just, do. Just, yeah, and it was really helpful yeah. because she taught me loads of tricks about slowing down, about breathing, about. About marking bits in the book and stuff like that, and it's massively helpful. And and by doing that, it, it it made me slow down my reading, which made me slow down the way I wrote, and which made me take it consider not just a written page, but actually as a spoken spoken piece of art as well, which makes you a better yeah. writer in turn. Yeah, we should focus on that because you, you uh, Robert, you've got you've got an actor background in any case, haven't you? So you've got inbuilt advantage there. Yeah, that does make it a bit easier once you've done mm. a bit of a. Acting, you sort of get used to. It. I mean, I find that background is very helpful when uh, writing dialogue because you straight away you sort of can yeah. get used to. Would I say that? You know, um, it, it makes it a lot easier for that. Yeah, person. yeah, brilliant. All right, we have two more submissions now. Let's get straight on to submission number four today. The Urkley Shadows by Michael W. Thomas. QR code there too. You may wonder what all those things are down there. Well, I don't know. Um, scan it on your phone and you'll find out. You'll you'll go to whichever corner of the internet Michael wants you to go to. It's a psychological with elements of supernatural. And this is Michael's blurb. Teenager Jonathan Parry emigrates to Canada with a dark secret, a crime for which someone else is arrested. He's escaped or he's free, or is he? Something inhuman bides its time, allowing him to make a new life for himself. Then it crosses the ocean to seek him out and take its revenge. His account of his fate comes into the hands of Will Appland, a Saskatoon policeman. Will soon finds that it speaks to a darkness in his own family. In Jonathan's name, he plans his own vengeance. Not a bad title, says Kate. I agree. 
Um, let me tell you about Michael. Uh, Michael is the author of 11 titles. His latest poetry. Oh, it's still with us, poetry. Poetry collections are the stations of the day and under smoky light. His latest prose title is the, the Portswick Imp. I like that. Uh, collected stories. Uh, his work has appeared in the Antioch Review, Irish Studies Review, Irish University Review, Magazine 6, Crossroads. That's Poland. Wow. Etchings, Australia. Critical Survey and the TLS, among others. His novella ESP, 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 I think, because it's not capitalised, was recently shortlisted for the UK Novella Awards. Between 2004 and 2009, he was poet in residence at the Robert Frost Poetry Festival, Key West, Florida. And that's his website, it's Michael Thomas Co. UK. Um, an extremely distinguished bio, only to be matched, I think, Michael, by a distinguished reading from our very own Robert The Urkely Shadows by Michael, read by Robert. Saskatoon Star Clarion, Friday, October 20. The body of a man was found in an apartment on Cumberland Avenue South early Wednesday morning. His identity is yet to be made public, but he is thought to have been a European landed immigrant living alone. There was no sign of disturbance. The alarm was first raised by his upstairs neighbour, who had spoken with him through his door a couple of times, but received no response to further attempts. The involvement of a person or persons unknown is not suspected. 1. Will was about to go off shift. The station was quiet for a Saturday afternoon, so the one-off arrangement with Smeets had turned out okay. He'd needed a break from the streets, but trolls attracted trouble on the weekend. Through the window, he could see the last stragglers being exited from the city library and smiled. There was Grace Pop Pope School, holding open the door as she'd done forever. The lady had a way with her, no doubt of it. When he was twelve, he tried bribing everyone in his grade to return his overdue books. At last, Dad had driven him downtown, frog-marched him into the lobby, nodded at Grace and gone to wait in the car. He'd been left with her wrath and what felt like the whole province's population looking on. Man, she didn't look a day older than when she'd torn those strips off him. But of course, she was older, and so was he, and so it would go on. Except for this Cumberland Avenue guy. Smeets had jumped at the chance to take his place with Terry M. He needed to be out in the city in the way Will didn't. He'd had ants in his pants since Wednesday, when the pair of them had discovered the guy. And Terry M had arrived. There'd been a break-in at a store in Market Mall, and then he was heading back along Cumberland when he saw the car, just in time. In fact, to catch the tail end of Smeets' usual performance. Will had been Smeets' patrol pal often enough. He knew the theatrical drill, and the Cumberland episode was no different. Smeets stepping backwards, arm flung up, treading hard on Will's toes. Will should really should charge him for replacement boots, crying, Whoa, you don't want to see this! Whether this was a bloody drunk or a bunch of white goods. But there'd been nothing to see. Not of the kind they were trained and seasoned to expect. Still, Will had to hand it to Smeets. There was something about the place, the feel of it, that justified his antics. Terry M had agreed, and he had absolutely no time for vibes and auras. Just secure the scene of the crime, report, turn things over to superiors and forensics. But what crime had there been? No break-in, nothing even forced. The lady upstairs said she might have heard something the night before, but... She was the devil, she said, for falling asleep with the TV on, so it could have just as easily been from some late repeat soap. Nothing looked disturbed, yet everything felt that way. The guy was on the bed, calmness itself, as though he'd decided on the moment's lie down and just zzed off. College type, they thought at the time, and inquiries had quickly located his place of work, a prof at the uni, it seemed. And yes, Smeets had tried to be his usual upfront self when he arranged the swap with Will, but he'd still look spooked, a little wilder than usual about the eyes. That smell, he'd said again, like he had in the apartment, like all of them had. It didn't seem to come from any one place. They'd eased open the walk-in closet, they'd looked under the bed, nothing. It was as though the guy had had a visitor, maybe more than one. Anyway, someone who wasn't crazy about washing. An ancient smell, Smeets had said, prompting Terry M's usual roll of the eyes. But old Smeets, he'd pressed on. 
A smell from down the ages, he insisted. Will always let the pair of them indulge their routine. No, no, hear me out from Smeets. Give it a rest, Asimov, from Terry. He just liked to listen to their hooey. And maybe Terry's counter-suggestion was right. Maybe the guy was long overdue a trip to the laundromat, though the place had, sh had a shared washer and dryer. Okay, so maybe he couldn't work them. Profs, eh? So, the genius room is picking on Smeets. Um, ooh, 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 where is it now? Where is it? Backstory is happening too soon. Um, Vagabond says Smeets is a terrible name. I don't know why. I don't, I don't mind that. But um, hard to say, even in your head. And Martin says, I think it's a brand of mints. <laughs> I don't think it is. <laughs> it isn't, honestly. It's different. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and he says the voice here i'm getting a bit bit muddled uh archaic caps not picking up a supernatural tone well, I, it's gonna come isn't it vicky a lot of explanation yeah there is actually it's front loaded and i don't know who but somebody i just picked that up was saying oh yeah hannah backstory a little soon in the narrative i want to know what's happening right now yeah kind of we often get manuscripts where you know that it's it's going to it's going to develop but the writer really is writing themselves in that happens a lot and uh michelle's getting me excited because it's a canadian setting so we're talking um just a few moments ago uh with jamie and robert about um uh, reading the importance of read your own uh, words out and um i think eva says um you can get word to read it out for you and then rg worsley says well can it cope with were um name place place names like keswick keswick probably say keswick i don't i doubt whether it can what did you think to that jamie um yeah i so i think um I think there's a couple of things for me but I, 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 it starts in the wrong place like there's there's an event that's happened which is interesting and exciting and we've got a newspaper article about it and then somebody reminiscing about it mm. i just don't understand why you wouldn't start with the event because then that's an interesting strong start whereas we've got mm. a newspaper article which is very passive and then somebody referring back to it in a in a slightly confusing way so it just yeah. feels like a missed opportunity to me it's a bit I think. blurry I think it's isn't it really you're not, you're not getting you're not yeah. getting a strong hit yeah there's no it's not you don't know where you are you, although actually on the plus side there is quite a nice sense of that small town canadian thing which i love canada and it and that really does come yeah. through but I, yeah. I feel like he's sort of like gone in in the wrong place it's like there's something in there but he's just sort of missed it if, if that makes sense yeah because the bur blurb i thought was strong it's got an interesting cut title it's got a really strong bio um but it just yeah it just seems to have sort of like misfired slightly it's like it's what you say about writing it writing into an in, into it and i and I see, you do see this a lot don't you? you see people have to sort of work their way into the story right all the time if it, just this they, there is a nugget of a good start there it's just he's he's off yeah. it off to the side somehow and needs to focus on that i think yeah 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 i think that's right and uh that's what the genius room is saying a narrative needs more focus to focus in um needs more paragraphs says rg worsley hannah says i've no idea what's going on pay attention come on please uh what do we pay you for oh, we don't of course um and you haven't made us care about anyone says vagabond that is quite uh, quite damning actually we've got to start caring pretty soon but maybe maybe you cared did you robert uh, no, not particularly. No, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Just asking. Um, I thought, <laughs> although uh, I do, I do think I agree with Jamie. I think there's something there. There is, there is an intrigue there. You know, we do have a dead body, and we don't know why. And that, this yeah. started out with that, so that's that's good. But it's just told in a really odd way. We've got yeah. the newspaper article, and we've got this complete segue to. Um, you know a library which doesn't seem to have any connection to anything so why is that there and then mm. we're sort of hearing him talking about the event in the past tense and it's just it was just told in a very strange way that when i was first reading it i couldn't completely work out what was going on in certain places so i just think it just needs to approach it in a different way i think the the idea the concept the title all that works it's just the approach is just not quite right for me at the moment. fair enough fair enough good all right let i this this is the 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 time in the show where i think we should actually um see how all the all the submissions are stacking up against each other remember it's quite 
it's quite an important show this because it decides who gets sent to um, our publishing partner head of Zeus um, and Becky Rush's Irrespectable Sin is the one that you've got to beat and that was I don't know why but for some reason it's, it's very often it's the first show of the month that gets the high scores um, Becky was there right in together with a number of other really really successful manuscripts that show um, and she got an astonishing 83 points 83 so that's what you're going to beat no one's doing that yet not yet but we have one more submission today and that is this it's fell dark fantasy it's from galadriel and there's a qr code there too very short simple blurb this is galadriel's blurb when 14 year old stafford polk unearths the skeleton of a giant hound he opens the gate to an ancient dark legend forced to face the truth of his past and stalked by fear he can't outrun he must release his own darkness or forfeit more than his life let me tell you about galadriel <clears throat> I write poetry and fantasy from a tiny studio at the foot of Castle Mound. That sounds impossibly romantic, <coughs> but ironic almost. Um, I'm influenced by folklore and legends, dreams and visions, the landscape and the natural world. I also enjoy soul writing and assemblage poetry. I'd like to know what that is, assemblage poetry. It sounds a bit like lost and found poetry. Um, I won the Creative Writing Prize during my BA in English. Once I read my poems at a poetry festival in the church ruin where Fell is set, and was approached by two small press publishers. Naively, I declined. Oh, well, they'll still be around. Uh, MA in Roman myth and history followed, and then I taught English for 10 years. Fell is my first novel. The journey has been a long but fruitful slog. I doubt there's not a piece of narrative theory or how-to instruction left that I have neither read or practiced. I've honed the bones and flesh of Fell. I hope it shows, says Galadriel, and... Um, I, I'm making good on my promise that yes, there is an encore for our extremely popular narrator, Barbara. Fell by Galadriel, read by Barbara. Stafford Park stomped past what once had been a blacksmith's forge and cottage. The gore of a half eaten deer lay hidden in the ruins. He slashed his stick through a dense cloud of flies that looked like a pile of floating horse muck. The smuts disappeared, then regrouped out of Stafford's reach, humming louder. Scowling, he began thrashing at the cleavers in the hedgerow. Dismembering fern, bramble, ragwort and valerian, he hacked his way down the lane. An oily, mineral tang of brutalised stems tinged the air, camouflaging any whiff of rot. Back three days and they still hadn't seen Mom. The one thing he asked Dad for. Thwack. One thing to do together. Thwack. Whiskey won. Again. Thwack. He launched a stick over the hedge, ripping the underarm seam of his jacket. He squeezed his eyes shut. Fourteen and still wearing crappy charity shop finds. Mom would never allow it. He yanked at the tear with his left thumb. Go on, rip. He'd have to have something new then. But even the jacket was against him. He pistoned his shoulders, driving up sniffles. Crying's for sissies, Dad said. Well, and these are crap too. He puffed his cheeks and wrenched the Velcro strap on his trainers, the deformed left hand surrendering all deafness to the right. Gah! He stamped his foot down and levered the trainer off at the heel with his other foot. Screw you! He screamed, hurling the shoe. It landed in a grassy verge out of sight. The lane shimmered with quiet heat, a buzzard mule overhead. Angus spent, Stafford watched under the shield of his hand, crows mobbing the bigger bird. The buzzard seemed untroubled by their efforts. With a tilt of its wing, it dismissed them. Sighing, Stafford checked the lane before removing his jacket and tying it around his waist. Wouldn't do to scare anyone or have them gawping. Dad's words. He wasn't supposed to get sun on his arm either. Who knew you could get sunburn on burn scarring? He'd learned like a puppy whose nose is rubbed in its own piss, never to discuss his disfigurement. Deny it all you like, but you know, Dad. You were there, so bugger the sun. Stafford clawed up to the verge. Holding a gate post, he shoved his drainer on, then climbed the gate. 
resting against the top rail, he scraped his fringe back, studying the meadow beyond. He'd love to see a fox. He didn't fear them like... Shut up, he said. You're not spoiling this. The ground flashed in places where a river flowed like chiffon soon with some sequence. Stafford sighed with pleasure. He hugged himself, resting his chin in the crook of his arm. Just got to catch that at the right time, then ask. A sprawling copse of trees bordered the meadow's far side. Stafford squinted. Something glowed in its dense shade. Strange. No smoke or flames for it to be a fire, nor the right colour. Water reflecting? He dropped down into the meadow. Closer, he recognised the trees as oak and lime. Under their canopy slouched an old barn. Shimmering. Light painted its edges. Aliveness fizzed in Stafford's limbs, fluttering into his chest. He slowed, tilting his head. The barn door suddenly swung open. Stafford scarecrowed. Was he trespassing? That's all he needed, someone else telling him to get off their land. Where to hide? If he moved now, he'd make that fallen oak. Ducking, his sniper crawled behind it. Slow as a sunken object surfacing through deep water, movement wavered near the opening. Stafford shielded his eyes. Could it be a fox after all? A shaded, scraggy animal crawled out into the overgrown grass and nettles. Stafford gasped at its hunched form the head twisting side to side. It was a man. The man convulsed under a haze of flies. He left the undergrowth, loping on all fours, naked, tanned and muscular beneath the filth. He stopped and sucked water from around the clump of reeds. Then, trailing spittle, lurched upright and sniffed the air. He pushed back long, dark, matted hair and bathed his face in the sun, revealing a thick, leather collar circling his neck. So straight to the genius room where uh, uh, who is it? Um, yeah, um, 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 Martin says "Bugger the Sun" is harshly poetic, and RG Woozy says "Bugger the Sun" was a hit for Erasure in '84. I don't think it was, <laughs> but it could have been. It could have been. Oh, uh, Martin's aliveness fizzed in his limbs. Bit clumsy for me. Ed says, overwritten for me. Um, Michelle says, very cinematic. Anna says, good drip feeding that something major has happened to staff in the past. Um, slouch and old barn, says Michelle. Good imagery. Vagabond. Tiny bit of trimming still needed, but really enjoyed that. What did you think, Robert? Yeah, no, I, likewise, I, I really enjoyed that, actually. Um, I thought it, the writing was quite nice. It was quite cinematic, as somebody said. There was good descriptions and imagery kind of took me along with it. Um, I like the title. I, I sort of, yeah, I was, I was quite engaged with it. Um, the only thing I'm not sure about is obviously where it's going. I'm a little bit uh, unsure about that. But other than that, I thought it was a really engaging, a really solid submission. Good. Can't Excellent. Really Fine. Much, much short, about it, really. No, short, short and sweet, Jamie. Um, I love that. Oh, wow. Yeah, Look really at your numbers. Really 80, good. 80, 100, and 100. Wow. You I, obviously did, yeah. I mean, I really did. It, 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 to me, it, it reminded me, actually, of a book called Bone Jack by Sarah Crow, who's another um, Litopia alumni. alumni. Mm, okay. um, but also, it had feelings of um, sort of like Elidor and classic Alan Garner, stuff like that, which I love. Right, um, yes, absolutely, yeah. Oh, yeah I can identify just that. Just a yeah. really lovely visceral opening. Like, there's a couple of bits that were a bit overwriting, overwritten, but I think that's a, a small editing job. Um, I thought she did a really good job of um, seeding information uh, without giving, but you know, sort of dripping stuff back family life something happened in the past i think there's it was just really really well done um yeah i would definitely carry on reading that good excellent excellent um rg says rg Wizzy says it reminds me of the slightly creepy kids tv series that used to be on with haunting theme music yeah actually um elidor love that says vagabond yeah great book. um yeah so general approval there let's let's look at the 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 numbers 76 is creeping up isn't it creeping up and Genius Room clearly liked that a lot. Um, love the title. I think the title's great too, actually. It's really simple. It's very difficult these days just to find a one-word title that works, but I think that one does. Let's say that's what it's going to be, a 76. Um, what does that mean? Well, 
this is what it means look at the, the look at the green there it's all moved it's all moved the last submission of the day dark fantasy by galadriel mitchell morfell has got greens across the board for title blurb craft and bang which means <laughs> Congratulations, Galadriel. You are the show winner. Absolutely, you are. And you're tantalizingly close to being the month's winner, but you're not! Because I have to tell you that the extraordinary score achieved by Becky Rush for a respectable sin. Um, Becky herself, a licensed criminal investigator. A respectable sin. It's kind of a retelling of Lizzie Borden, but it's not your mother's Lizzie Borden. That is our month's winner. How about that? <laughs> and she's live with us on YouTube, folks. She's just entered the building, but better late than never. It's fantastic when uh, when we have uh, our, our winners. Uh, so you'll be going straight off to head of you. So don't expect to hear anything for a month or so. But um, it's a different different means to an end. Actually, we it's the least we can do for those people out there who spend their weeks and months and years writing for our entertainment to broaden our minds and to make our world just a bit better than it is now we appreciate what you do from the bottom of our hearts and we will be back same time next week all of the world's a stage welcome to the show i glance at you you smile at me like we're all alone 